so today we will read about the tetanus so tetanus is generally asked as a scenario, clinical scenario based question in which the examiner will uh, give you a question or a clinical scenario that of uh, that a driver who suffered a road traffic accident and his wounds his or her wounds got gets contaminated with the soil uh, lying on the road so and the and that driver presents to the opd in a spastic condition or a very severe condition in which uh, his muscles were very much contracting so in that case you will be asked about the pathogenesis of the condition about the diagnosis of the condition about the lab diagnosis and about the prevention of the condition so all those things we will talk in this lecture so let's start the lecture on the tetanus so tetanus is caused by a clostridium tetany so clostridium tetany is very important bacteria uh, there are some very important points about that clostridium tetany which one should must remember that is it is a obligate anaerobe it is a gram positive bacilli and it has a drumstick appearance what does the obligate anaerobe means obligate anaerobe means it lives only in strict absence of oxygen if there is any bit of oxygen there present there then it cannot grow so it need a strict absence of oxygen and it is gram positive bacilli and the a uh, very catchy point is that it has a very characteristic appearance this is called as the drumstick appearance see here this is the elongated bacilli and there is a terminal round spore we have seen the drumstick it looks like somewhat like this so this is also looking somewhat like this so hence its name is given as drumstick appearance and this is a very important question also like which bacteria appears like a drumstick so it is clostridium tetany okay so let's come to the pathogenesis of the condition before pathogenesis uh, starting the pathogenesis one should must remember there are two virulence factors of the clostridium tetany which are very important and those two are the two exotoxins those two exotoxins are the tetanolysin and the tetanospasmin tetanolysin causes hemolysis of the rbcs while tetanospasmin is the main culprit okay it causes the spastic condition the contraction of the muscles okay so uh, from now on we our most focus will be on the tetanospasmin so we will start the pathogenesis with the entry of the clostridium tetany how does the clostridium tetany enters into the body and how does that tetanus develops so clostridium tetany gets entry into the body through the wounds as it is abundantly present in the soil so whenever the patient or the driver is suffering the road traffic accident it he is or she is lying on the road and on the road there must have been some of uh, some amount of soil and we know that uh, clostridium tetany are present abundantly in the soil so from there the uh, clostridium tetany enters inside the wounds of the person and from there the pathogenesis begins so injury site provides the anaerobic and the reduced state how does that happen we know that whenever there is injury on the body the body tries to reduce the blood supply to that side so that the blood loss from the body can be reduced so that's why due to decrease in the blood supply to the wound region or to the injury site there is development of anaerobic condition or the reduced state and these two states are very important for the growth of the clostridium tetany okay so these two uh, the anaerobic state and the reduced state are very important very favorable conditions for the development of the clostridium tetany for growth of clostridium tetany so that's why it multiplies and produces the tetanospasmin okay and this tetanospasmin gets internalized at the motor nerve endings this tetanospasmin gets internalized at the motor nerve endings suppose this is the motor nerve there okay so suppose this is the motor nerve ending and this is that our tetanospasmin so this gets and this is wound so from wound the bacteria has grown it has produced this tetano tetanospasmin and this tetanospasmin is getting internalized into the motor nerve in into the motor nerve ending and after internalization into the motor nerve ending this tetanospasmin moves in a retrograde fashion okay so it it has a retrograde transport 
and due to that retrograde transport it reaches to the GABA producing inhibitory neuron terminals and when it reaches to such type of inhibitory neurons it causes inhibition of the release of the GABA neurotransmitter that means there is loss of inhibition when the GABA will not be released by the axon of the TTM spasm there will be no inhibition of the uh, firing of the uh, excitatory nerves so that means excitatory nerves will fire more and that's why in absence of the inhibitory signals there will be excessive contraction of the muscle that causes spasm of the muscle and the tetanus develops so whenever the pathogenesis is asked uh, you have to write right from the entry of the bacteria into the body till the development of the tetanus now what are the clinical features uh, that we see uh, whenever the tetanus develops so first tetan uh, first uh, symptom that we see is the trismus or the lock jaw there will be locking of the temporomandibular joint then next we see the spasm of the limb muscle contraction of the limb muscle then we see spasm of the trunk muscles and then the spastic paralysis is also seen the most last seen are the these two conditions that is called as the rhesus sardonicus and the opisthotonus position rhesus sardonicus means there is sustained facial muscle spasm okay so sustained facial muscle spasm leads to constant you know uh, striking of between the two teeth this is called as grin grinding so uh, that is called a rhesus sardonicus so that will be seen uh, if treatment is not given an opisthotonus position in which the body assumes a extended position okay body will assume a extended position full body is in extension all the joints will be in extended position okay so these two are the uh, complications also which will occur if medical care is not given early okay so these are all the clinical features that we see and we clinically diagnose with the clinical history and with these features that the condition is nothing but the tetanus only now we do the lab diagnosis so lab diagnosis is only for confirmation okay if we wait for the report to come from the lab then the patient will must the patient will die of course so we we have to make the diagnosis by clinical history and by the clinical presentation the lab diagnosis should be reserved just for the confirmation of the case okay nothing else so to save the patient we have to start the empirical therapy just by the clinical history and the clinical presentation by clinical diagnosis lab diag in lab diagnosis we have to confirm the uh, case and how will we confirm we have to first collect the specimen what type of specimen do we collect so we have to collect the necrotic tissue from the depth of the wound from which the bacteria must have entered and where the bacteria is growing so those necrotic tissue from the depth of the wound should be collected and then wound exudates and the wound swabs are also taken after that we do the direct detection so in direct detection we produce a smear with the exudate or the swab and we gram stain it and the gram uh, after gram staining we see it under the microscope where we see gram positive bacilli with terminal round spores with terminal round spores which has a drumstick appearance that gives a clue that yes this may be clostridium titani then we do the uh, for confirmation we can do the culture so in culture we use we can use two type of media one is the blood agar media with polymixin b which is an antibiotic and the robertson cooked meat broth media these two are the media remember blood agar with polymixin b should be inoculated and should be incubated anaerobically because we know that it is an anaerobic bacteria so it is inoculated on two media with the exudate and with the uh, tissue necrotic uh, tissues we inoculate on these two media we see the colonic characteristic after certain time like in blood agar media that is incubated anaerobically we see hemolytic colonies by hemolytic so this hemolytic colonies are due to tetanolysin exotoxin okay with swarming this is an important feature of the clostridium tetan in that it shows swarming okay it shows swarming so in the blood agar media the colonic characteristic is hemolytic colonies with swarming this should be remembered in the rcm broad media we see that the meat particles have turned black and there is a foul smell why why they have turned black we have seen that whenever the bacteria is a proteolytic bacteria then the meat particles will turn 
it will digest the protein from that meat particles from those meat particles and that will turn the meat to black and due to digestion of the protein there will be foul smelling but uh, in case of sacrolytic bacteria the meat particles turn pink why because there is digestion of the uh, saccharides from that meat part those meat particles that's why the meat turns pink in case of sacrolytic bacteria but we know that the clostridium titani is proteolytic that's why the meat particles turns black and there is production of the foul smell then we do the gram staining of course in any culture uh, we we have to do the gram staining finally so here also we do the gram staining uh, with the obtained colony smear is produced and gram positive bacilli with uh, domestic appearances appearance is seen okay next we, what we do is the toxigenicity test so in toxigenicity test that can be done in two ways in vitro and in vivo in vitro in in vitro test we take a blood agar media and over half of the media we spread the anti titanolysin anti toxin so that when the clostridium titani produces the uh, titanolysin uh, it will be neutralized on that half of the blood agar media and on that half of the blood agar media there will be no hemolysis so see here the clostridium titani is inoculated on the blood agar media and hemolysis does not occur on the antitoxin half of the blood agar media what does this show that means the bacteria is producing the same toxin okay that's why there is no hemolysis so we can get an indirect clue from here that the bacteria is producing the same toxin in in vivo test what we do in the tail of a mouse we inoculate the culture of the clostridium titani and within 24 hours we see spasms okay within 24 hours we see spasm and the first spasm is seen in the tail because we have inoculated the culture in the tail of the uh, mouse that's why we see the uh, first spasm in the tail and this also indirectly tells or indirectly uh, says that yes there is a uh, production of the uh, titano spasmin toxin from there so by that methods we can confirm the diagnosis of the we can confirm the diagnosis of the uh, yeah titanus now coming to the prevention part so prevention can be done in two ways one is the active immunization and the other one is the uh, uh, prevention after injury so in active immunization we give the uh, vaccine uh, in the childhood so that whenever injury occurs in future to that child no tetanus develops to him or her so in uh, active immunization we have many vaccines like we have tetanus toxoid we have dpt this is not used nowadays but may be used uh, but not in uh, use nowadays basically so yeah, tetanus toxoid dpt vaccine the td vaccine which is the tetanus toxoid and adult diphtheria okay this d is for this d is for adult diphtheria okay so td vaccine and the pentavalent vaccine these are the four vaccines for the uh, prevention of the tetanus now how does these four vaccines are given to the child according to the national immunization schedule 2020 according to nis 2020 national immunization schedule 2020 uh, the pentavalent vaccine is given at 6 weeks 10 weeks and 14 weeks okay and the dpt vaccine at the in the 16 to 24 weeks and then at booster at the 5 years and the td vaccine is given at 10 years and 16 years so total total how many doses total seven doses are given to the child's seven doses are given to the child okay for prevention of the uh, according to the national immunization schedule for prevention of the for prevention of the tetanus next what we give next what we have is how do we treat the uh, tetanus after injury so when there is injury when the injury has occurred then we have to treat if the depth of the wound is more than one centimeter and it is contaminated with the soil or saliva then we have to give the vaccine how do we give the vaccine so vaccine taken within five years if the vaccine has been taken by the person within the last five years then nothing has to be given if if the vaccine is taken more than five years but less than then td one dose has to be given and vaccine more than 10 years has been given then td one dose and human tetanus immunoglobulin should be given and vaccine status if unknown then td two doses and human tetanus immunoglobulin should be given so this is all about the tetanus about the prevention lab diagnosis and the clinical feature pathogenesis of the